Welcome to this edition of Intelligent Video Today. I'm your host, Steve Vonderhaar from Intelligent Research. Join us this time on the show, Nathan Aurora, co-founder and chief business officer over at UJO. Welcome, Nathan. And how you doing? Very good. Thanks for having me. So uh, we, I've long known UJA as a provider of uh, education platform capabilities uh, in the video realm. Uh, but mm -hmm. really, you're, you're evolving quite a bit over there at UJA. Tell us about how you're addressing the education market and how video plays a role in, in your ongoing activities there. Very good. Yeah, you're correct, Steve. You know, our first product is the, you know, the enterprise video platform, which is a purpose-built you know, video platform for teaching and learning um, and delivering that at scale. Um, you know, over the years, we, we continue to serve that same market that is the learning enterprise, but we've run that over time to provide products around digital accessibility, that is Panorama, uh, test proctoring, which is Verity, uh, our Verity product, uh, enterprise archiving of these very large work data workloads, which is Himalayas, and then engagement and audience engagement and student response systems, which is our Engage product. Right. So for a legacy video platform company, how does this broader product line help position you in the EDU market space? Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, our customers are the same. You know, that is the we serve the same audience. It's just really around being uh, serving them in, in a in a better way. And so we remain you know hyper focused around education, uh, but it allows us to rather than sort of be that player who expands horizontally. Um, across you know a number of different uh, uh, industries with the same product, we go deep, you know, and so we serve a, a single audience uh, with a number of different products that serve them more effectively, all within the same sort of realm and sort of flavor, which is media uh, or, or, or 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 video within their their institution, um, but being able to serve it across sort of different use cases. Right, so you know, we see this evolution in you just product line building upon your 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 foundation in the video world. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that evolution say about uh, video's role in education moving forward? Have we changed much since COVID, or what what's happening sure. in terms cool. of is is video still a key part of of the EDU tech stack, or is it uh, maybe waning a bit? Post pandemic, you know, certainly during the pandemic, you went from maybe 30, 40% utilization pre pandemic to basically near 100% video utilization post pandemic or sorry, during the pandemic, excuse me. It's coming back down from that, right? You know, you're not 100%. Maybe let's say, depending on the institution, it maybe find its way 60 to 80%. Um, so definitely certainly higher before uh, than it was, you know, before the pandemic, but, but it's not, you know, pandemic numbers. But what's interesting is it's accelerated this need within the enterprise to become more digital. And I, I use that in the broad. I don't mean just you know delivering within teaching and learning. What I mean is that they're all of the ways that they interact with their with their customer. That is that whether that be that a vendor, whether it be a student, whether it be a teacher, um, that has become much more digital. And so you'll pull your tuition and pay, excuse me, you'll pay your tuition by a digital means. Uh, you will request information like your transcripts by a digital mechanism. And so um, you'll interact with your alumni using a, a much more digital first structure. And so we see this sort of much more sort of let's become a much more digital campus as something that means that our products become much more pervasive, but it also means that there's a need to do things better and more cost effectively. And so if you're going to manage larger volumes of content, you're going to make content uh, a central part of the strategy, you, you have to make that more accessible. Uh, if you're talking about video and you want accompanying media, you have to make, sh make sure that everyone can benefit from that. And that's really where you know, we see a place uh, for our, our products uh, tool set and why we've really gone into serving uh, uh, this vertical much more deeply. Uh, if you're going to, for another example, is if you're going to you know, store all this content and you're going to need this sort of archive uh, content, you have to better archive that content and be able to scale that in the cloud much more effectively. And so, you know, at the end of the day, what, what this is doing is it's creating a much more rigorous discipline around um, video. So it, it really can't be an ad hoc strategy. It has to be this very central sort of enterprise deep strategy around media and, and, and video. So it, it really, as we see that digitization of the campus, of, of the school organization overall, video is being treated differently in some ways uh, by, by uh, institutions. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, when you look at, you know, 
the way that the stu students and, and instructors experience the pandemic and certainly in different ways, you really see that the cat is out of the bag when it comes to video. I mean, instructor training, which was always a barrier to sort of broad adoption, hit nearly 100 percent during the pandemic. And that, that was a sort of epic change, um, you know, that, that happened. And it was sort of a real inflection point uh, for the use of video and media more generally. Um, at the same time, you, you see a much more sort of um, demand centric adoption because students saw this benefit. Historically, if their institution wasn't a very video centric campus, they discovered that they could have an educational journey that mirrored how they experience other video tools like Netflix and YouTube. And so you're seeing that video has become much more pervasive, um, but that it's now doing more better with usually the same budget. And so, you know, making sure that the content is more engaging. And so you're going to see things like micro lessons, uh, that the content is of a higher order, uh, that it's automatically captioned very quickly, that can edit it and be made into different moments and structures more easily. And so you're seeing that video is being treated differently uh, because people are now expecting it to be part of the standard structure, uh, but they're also expecting it to start more closely mirror there's sort of social video and there's sort of video for entertainment, um, you know, use cases as well. So what you're telling me is that uh, uh, in the EDU world, the video genie is out of the bottle. Even even mm -hmm. as you go for broader digitization, yep. video is still a, a key playing a key role uh, in in managing the overall campus uh, uh, activities. Right. Mm -hmm. They're very much so. So um, uh, now you're on intelligent video today here and we talk about our artificial intelligence all the time and its impact on the development of uh, video related applications. How has the emergence of, of AI impacted uh, your uh, roadmap and go to market proposition? Uh, are we seeing significant changes in how you're looking at the world as a result of uh, all the hype and hoopla surrounding AI? Yeah, I mean, you certainly see this a lot. And being a company with a major office in Silicon Valley, we we hear a lot about this, and it, it is very exciting. You, we are at an inflection point with AI, and that's that's certainly the case. With the institutions that we serve, it's a much more measured approach. I mean, generative AI is is, is incredible, but it also has you know certainly concerns um, that we uh, that can, sort of can't go unnoticed. And so the institutions that we serve are going to take a much more sort of uh, wait and see approach. So they're going to going to be looking at this, seeing where it makes sense to adopt it, where it doesn't make sense to adopt it. Um, and so for us, it's it's doing things in, in perhaps what may appear to be on the surface slower than in sort of a typical corporate setting or you know, a B2C uh, type uh, uh, environment. Uh, but it's going to be uh, drive sort of ways to, to use it in meaningful ways, but not lose the academic rigor of an institution's core mission. You know, the phrase that popped in mind to me was uh, AI with a purpose when you're dealing with your audience. It's not right. That's AI a good way to for, think about uh, it. Not AI for AI's sake. That's right. Right. Exactly. I mean, these institutions have been here for, you know, hundreds of years. We'll be here long after, you know, I'm gone. And so, you know, AI is certainly here to say, you know, is, but they're going to it's going to have to be something where it it. It adapts to what the core mission is of the institution. Right. Um, it isn't sort of this sort of you know shiny object on the beach that you adopt and then you may sort of uh, discard um, at, at a later date when it's no longer convenient. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's say we get to a point five, maybe ten years down the road, where we're actually getting mm -hmm. institutional buy-in uh, towards the use of video in the e EDU space. Where do you think sure. uh, the application categories are really going to be? that are really going to be impacted by uh, the infusion of AI into a traditional EDU video platform. Yeah, we, we think a lot about this, you know, where's from a product standpoint, you know, our various products, you know, where they're going to um, have a role within AI and generative AI more, gen more specifically. You know, for us, um, the first is you're going to have to manage where you use that application. And so be, being able to provide thresholds of you know, is this generative AI or is this AI being used perhaps for a non-institutionally, you know, a mandated uh, purpose? And so being able to sort of provide gates and fences. So, which may seem sort of counterintuitive on the surface, right? Your first adoption of generative AI and AI is making sure you put fences around it. But but in some sense, it, it provides uh, a scaffold for folks to use it for the right purpose and then uh, eliminate the, the use of it for the wrong purpose. And so when we think of our, ourselves in the, from a product standpoint, our, I think the initial few years are going to be using it for you know, purposes that have been authorized by the institution and for our products to be able to 
look at the content, whether that becoming you know media content or video content uh, or proctored content, um, and be able to make sure that Gen of AI is being used per institutional standards. And then from there, you know, I, I think beyond that, it's really going to be uh, something that is um, led not by us at the company. Uh, that is a non not a company driven sort of strategy, but a much more sort of client led strategy where clients are going to come to us and say, hey, we see this use case here uh, or we see a use case around using generative AI um, perhaps to create portfolios for students um, who are um, wanting to create a summary of their academic journey. And there's just a tremendous number of neat use cases. And I think that, you know, as we talk to these customers, they're going to find these use cases that make sense for them. And then we'll sort of be the builders and providers of those tool sets. Well, I know it's a busy time with it being back to school season and all, but uh, mm -hmm. appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today on Intelligent Video today, Nathan. Appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Steve. Appreciate it, too. And we appreciate our audience tuning in for this edition of Intelligent Video Today. We invite you to subscribe uh, on our YouTube channel. Look for more interviews with industry thought leaders like Nathan. But for us at Intelligent Research and Intelligent Video Today, I'm Steve Vonderhaar. Thanks for your time.